All right, we're back. It's the Tasty Crypto Show. I'm Ryan Grace. He's Mad Mike. What's up, everybody? How are you, sir? I'm good, Ryan. I'm very good. How are you? I can't complain. It's yeah. Wednesday. Uh, I've heard some people around the office call this Synthetic Thursday, which I suppose makes tomorrow Synthetic Friday. We got Friday off. Yeah, long weekend. Yeah, you got any plans? Uh, I'm doing a big exotic trip to Milwaukee, Wisconsin from nice. Chicago uh, okay. Friday. So, you know, it's my girlfriend's birthday and it's kind of a big deal. So I thought I'd take her someplace real nice. Well, I hope you have great weather in Milwaukee. Let's jump into the show at Mike. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let me catch my breath, I suppose. What do you want to talk about today? I want to talk about Bitcoin price predictions. I'm going okay. to do the impossible. I want to speculate. I want to have a little bit of fun. Price targets? Price targets, okay. predictions. I want to go way down the road. Um, I think we're going to start off by looking at a few pretty well-known institutions and people and kind of get their take on it. Yeah, you know, it's almost like since the ETF approvals, in some circles, this has now been legitimized. I believe it was legitimized a long time ago. But in the eyes of many, this is now a legitimate asset. If you're an investment manager, you're a bank, you're in the business of putting out price targets, you're seeing the price targets come out. Yeah, I mean, they have a viable way to access Bitcoin. The whole country does. Um, and I think that is a big part of why these ETFs have been exploding in the news lately. Yeah, well, let's take a look at those price targets. I'm not sure where everybody's at. I have seen a couple of these numbers. Okay, I've seen the 250 out of Standard Chartered. But walk me through this. What are we looking at? The X and Y axis here. Clearly, these are price targets for Bitcoin. But you know, what is this related to? How do we get there? So I'm not seeing the chart. So you're looking at the uh, where's everybody at slide, right? Yeah. yeah okay. Right. So what we have here are we have Van Eck, Peter Brandt, um, who, for everybody that doesn't know what Peter Brandt looks like, he's the, the man in the blue collar shirt and glasses. Uh, JP Morgan, Standard Chartered, uh, Bernstein, Kathy Wood. Um, so this, this is Point kind of spread. Yeah, we have a, a pretty, pretty diverse spread here. And I, I, I couldn't get a lot of bearish predictions. Most people who make Bitcoin predictions are by nature bullish. Sure. Um, aside from, of course, JP Morgan, which is the first one on our list. So we can see here JP Morgan is predicting a $40,000 Bitcoin price post having. So they're very bearish on the having. Okay. Um, and yeah, I guess that's my question. What's the time frame here when you look at this? So we've got people that are coming out now, and we've, we've talked about this on our show as well, our price targets closer to 200. We'll work through that in a second. But you're seeing that that, in the eyes of many, some of these you know, respected institutions, that seems to be a feasible like, number yeah. that we can get to, right? It's, it's realistic. Yeah. What's the time frame, though? Is that, is that what we're looking at on yeah. the x-axis? Yes, exactly. So where JP Morgan is, we're looking at uh, present day, basically. And then it extends all the way to 2030, um, where we see Kathy Wood at the top right there. And she's calling Bitcoin at 1 million by 2030. Okay. And over the course of the next 15 years, we have Peter Brandt, 130, Standard Charter, 250, Bernstein, uh, pretty modest, 90, Van X, 325. All these numbers, Ryan, I couldn't find, most of them that I found from institutions and individuals were much higher than this. I can't believe how how These bullish. are conservative numbers. These are the conservative well. numbers okay. I could find, with the exception of Kathy Wood. Interesting. Yeah, how do we get to these levels in that sense? I mean, it's the having event is, I think, the catalyst for a lot of these predictions. Okay. Um, of course, that is going to decrease supply, but not to the levels to substantiate some of these numbers we're looking at here. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, I think this hinges on adoption, right? And yeah. so we need to see that rate of adoption continue, which I don't know if it's 12, 13 percent um, compounded annually. But we've gone from, I think, like 330 million global crypto users to 400 some, 500 plus maybe. But the expectation is that in terms of global crypto users will be somewhere near a billion by, say, 2030. You know, when you break down that growth yeah. rate, many have done this in the space, you're looking at something that's growing along the lines of what we saw in terms of internet adoption throughout the mid-90s and into the early 2000s. And so I think that's probably what a lot of this is predicated on, right? More people, more demand, higher prices. Right. Certainly the, the having and the slowdown in the supply issuance is beneficial to that. But that's my guess here, unless there's something else that goes into it from a more fundamental perspective. 
Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it is adoption. It's investor sentiment, which we're going to get into a little bit later on. We're going to take a look at um, the rising numbers and people, Americans specifically, participating in this space. And it's much higher than I thought it would have been before I saw these numbers. Um, but next up, Ryan, Michael Saylor had $10 million. So he gets his own slide okay. for that prediction. Super bullish. Super bullish. And we were talking in the office earlier about what would have to happen in the world in order for Bitcoin to reach $10 million. And none of it is positive for civilization. <laughs> yeah, that's a scary price, right? Yeah. Because you have to almost wonder what happened, maybe what went wrong in the existing financial system for this much money to flow into this asset. I don't know what that market cap is that it implies, but it's... Um, it's got to be close to $100 trillion, I think right? it is $100 because so we're at $1 trillion today, um, give or take, about, about. And that's, that's a massive market cap. Yeah. I mean, things went terribly wrong, I believe, for the dollar, for there to be that many dollars flowing into that yeah. asset. Right? There has to be a complete loss of trust um, okay. in the, the centralized governments across the world in order for us to reach these levels. Yeah, this is an interesting exercise because people might say, well, that's insane. But that's assuming that, you know, the dollar buys the same amount of goods and services that it does today. Right? Which, like, I think if you're yeah. looking at a $10 million Bitcoin price, then it implies you know, almost an extreme debasement or devaluation of the currency, right? Because what's even relevant then, you know, what's relevant is just whether or not you have Bitcoin. Because... The purchasing power might be the only thing that's retained. Yeah. It's not like all of a sudden you have $10 million in Bitcoin. It might be a reality where, and this is, again, just <laughs> hypothetical, but it's a reality where, well, a house costs one Bitcoin now yeah. on average, and one Bitcoin is $10 million. Like most things, it, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. But in that reality, you could maybe get there yeah. in Bitcoin priced in dollar terms, right? Yeah. I it's mean, similar if I took uh, Venezuelan bolivars and we priced things in that, right? The Apple stock price is a lot higher in a different currency. Yeah. In order to fathom this, you have to understand that Bitcoin is only valuable relative to something else. Um, and we're talking about fiat when we're talking about these levels, of course. Um, so, I mean, could it happen? Sure. I hope it doesn't happen. Yeah. That's a good point. Because like, we're not, the world isn't going to have anything for us to buy at that point. It's going to be <laughs> Right. Something anarchy. went terribly wrong, right? Um, oh, we're going to be rich. We've got Bitcoin. It's $10 million. Maybe you just retain your purchasing power in yeah. like some horrific environment. I don't want to see this. Yeah. Right? I don't think anybody does. So that's the extreme case, though. But it is interesting if you assume, okay, things don't go terribly wrong where the, you know, the purchasing power, the value of the dollar... It completely is eroded. Let's say that doesn't happen, and you do just see more demand. Then maybe it's realistic to think that there's a, you know, six-figure Bitcoin price, a quarter million dollar Bitcoin price. Interesting to see that Kathy Wood has a million dollar Bitcoin price. It seems to be, it, to me, it seems like a stretch, right? I'm very bullish. That seems to be a lot, but maybe we get there. Yeah, and, and she is looking way down the road um, compared to the other one. She's looking at 2030. Where that's where she sees the Bitcoin at a million. I'm not a million, a million plus. Okay. Her previous assessment was a million. She raised it to over a million. So let me ask you then, if you hit those levels, do you stay there in your opinion? Right? Like when we look at price targets, it's a target. Maybe you hit the target, yeah. but is that a sustained level at which Bitcoin trades? Well, at that point, it's the, the price of Bitcoin. Is, <clears throat> it's, there's going to be a, a, a fundamental shift in the way the world operates and works, right? Or it doesn't work in this scenario. So I think Bitcoin would hold value and potentially go up further if the world's economy continues to deteriorate, which would have to happen, in my opinion, in order to see Bitcoin um, at these levels. Yeah. Interesting. Because what else is there? I mean, there's gold. And I think gold, we would see the same inflated prices. I don't think it's either or. I think gold's going to be right up there with Bitcoin. Okay. What goes into a lot of this, right? Like, what are the key drivers that get us to these much higher prices? And I don't think it's much of a stretch to say that Bitcoin can go to a six-figure price target, maybe 100000 I mean, we're, what? 30,000 away from that or so yeah. here today. That's, I don't think that's an insane view. At one time, you would have been labeled crazy, but not anymore. Times have changed, I suppose. But what goes into that? Like, what are the drivers? When you start to look at 
this bank or so and so has this target. What's behind it? You had mentioned the having. We'll take a look at our price targets here in a second. But what else do you think has to either grow or has to occur so that we, you know, we would realistically get there? I mean, the only thing that I can see where we have a lot of inflow to continue to flow into Bitcoin, which it's starting to slow. Last week was the first time I think we saw more outflows than inflows into the, the largest Bitcoin ETFs. Okay, so ETFs. I mean, I think we've got a slide here that we can uh, we can pull up around that. So here's ETF inflows, and it um, doesn't have Grayscale on here. Right. It gives you a sense. And this is in um, in Bitcoin on the, on the left-hand side, right? Correct. Yeah, okay. Um, so as far as what has to happen in order to, for Bitcoin to achieve some of these levels we were looking at, um, I can tell you Van Eck, and a lot of this I think is just technical and I don't believe a lot of it, um, but Van Eck says our medium term target is 325,000 um, and they just compare that because it's half the market cap of gold, um, which also corresponds to the minimum trout at peak cycle for the asset. Okay. Um, we have Standard Chartered. They listed three reasons to back up their $250,000 by 2025, and that is ETF inflows, interest from reserve managers, um, and the upcoming Bitcoin halving event. So it's a lot of redundancy as to why these these prices are, these predictions are what they are. Um, but you know, it comes down to access and debasement. I think. Okay. Yeah. I. I mean, I tend to agree with you too. I think that's the key. Why do you want to invest in this in the first place? Well, it's a hedge to a lot of things going wrong with the existing system. Doesn't mean that that's going to happen with the existing system, but maybe you want a little bit of that. And enough people seem to have stumbled upon yeah. this uh, and you know believe that to be true, that there's a lot of demand and these ETFs facilitate it. So we've got ETF inflows that support this. That has been over the last three months, I think, the key driver. Right? We've seen 11 billion in net inflows there. It's certainly been supportive of the price. It's gotten us to new all-time highs. We're not breaking higher and higher every day, but clearly, you know, this has been a bullish event. Uh, I would imagine that we don't just stay here and we see continued inflows over time. That said, when you think about this in gold terms, as a lot of this analysis will look at, compare the market cap, the characteristics of Bitcoin, et cetera, there is that kind of stock to flow component to it. And maybe you could walk everybody through this um, for anybody that's not familiar with this sort of approach. Um, there's a guy on Twitter that's done a lot of analysis around this. Uh, yeah. The handle escapes me. His name escapes me, but we'll have to, maybe we could talk to him at some point. Um, sure. I'd love to. But when you, what is the stock to flow and... 14, so, 14 million, Mike, what is on this chart? So stock to flow is used to assess the value of scarcity. So okay. that applies to historically commodities, but lately it's been getting a lot of interest um, to forecast the future price of Bitcoin. So stock refers to simply the total existing supply. Flow is the rate at which um, new supply comes into the uh, community, in this right. case, Bitcoin. And stock to flow ratio is just simply you know, you divide the stock by the flow, and then you come up with that ratio number. Um, so as you can tell, it's very bullish. If we're looking at the chart here, we can see the stock to flow model has Bitcoin at 14 million by 2030, which I think is unreasonable. I think the stock to flow model, this is, the thing about the stock to flow model is it excludes all other outside variables aside from the scarcity element. Um, okay. And but historically, it's been pretty accurate. But the question is, will it hit 14 million? I, again, I, I hope not because I don't know what's gonna, what the world's going to look like if Bitcoin's at 14 million in six years from now. Yeah, I mean, I don't think any of these charts are predictive of the future. Obviously, it's not it's not gospel sort of thing. Um, but there does seem to be a correlation, right? I mean, this is following that path. So without picking specific numbers, even though that's the exercise here today, what's your price target? It does seem that just based on these principles right. that this could likely continue to trend higher. Again, limited supply, more money coming into it, just hooked up the ETFs. We'll see if this plays out. It hasn't followed perfectly, no model does, but it's a, uh, a framework, I suppose. So, I, Ryan, I want to bring up something. You mentioned ETFs again. That just happened a couple hours ago. Uh, the BlackRock CEO, Larry Fink, okay. uh, tweeted that the Bitcoin ETF is the fastest growing ETF in the history of ETFs. Yeah. Isn't that hard to believe? Best ever. 
the fastest in the history of all the thousands of ETFs that have ever existed, Bitcoin is growing faster than anyone. So that's impressive, isn't it? It is impressive. Um, there's work to be done still, Mike. Yeah. You know, you look at the GLD ETF, I think assets under management there are north of 50 billion. So we'll see across the space if we get there. If you include GBTC, which a lot of institutional capital was in, um, in the trust prior to the, the ETF conversion, then you're closer to 50 billion all in across the 11 ETFs. But I think we surpass that eventually. You know, I think that this could be, if we view it as digital gold, then maybe it's going to be bigger than the traditional gold ETF. So I think we have a ways to go still, Yeah. right? Um, and to touch back on Michael Saylor, a quote that uh, he said that a lot of people have repeated, Bitcoin is certainly at least digital gold. It's got all the great attributes of gold, and it's got none of the defects, okay. which um, comparing Bitcoin to gold, I tend to agree with him, except it doesn't have that tangibility, which people like. Yeah, and I think it's, it's hard because there isn't this physical representation of it. It's not tangible in that sense. It's sometimes hard to wrap your head around. There's also people that have a very, very bearish view on gold. I think some of those same people have a, a fairly bearish view, to say the least, on Bitcoin. But I do believe that it's the best kind of, I guess, analogy or, or um, it's the closest thing to it. Yeah. What, what else can you possibly compare it to? It's so unique, right? So we've got the ETFs driving this. Um, we have models for ways to look at this. I think the next thing that we show here is just investor sentiment. When you look at ownership of crypto, um, broadly speaking, you know, across a lot of retail brokerages or where individuals own this, um, you know, outside of those institutions, obviously, it tends to skew a little bit younger in terms of millennial generation, accounts for a larger percentage of crypto ownership. But the sentiment around it, you know, certainly cyclical, um, but it seems to be improving. You know, we're definitely seeing more and more ownership. We've gone from, I think at one point, you know, roughly everybody, 80% are aware of crypto, but only 20% own it sort of thing. We're, we're certainly seeing that change. And, and again, the ETFs uh, provide for, you know, maybe easier access in some cases. But this is going to continue to just be the driver, I think, that we're, we're talking about, right? Whatever yeah. the mechanism is for you to purchase this crypto, the demand is increasing. Yeah, it's, I mean, 40%. When I saw that number, and some people have it at 35, um, but the consensus seems to be about 40% of Americans own cryptocurrency, and that's compared to stocks, which is 60%. So that's that's a lot of that's a lot of crypto owners out there. Yeah, um, absolutely. And since we're talking about investor sentiment, I spent a little time on Reddit because I wanted to get people's opinions of Bitcoin and why they do not buy it, right? So here's a couple of them. Here's a couple of just normal people's opinions on crypto and why they hate it so much. Okay. Um, it has no intrinsic value. You might as well gamble in a casino. What's your take on the intrinsic value of Bitcoin? Its intrinsic value is in what it inherently is, which is it's a hedge to this existing system. It's a hedge to you know, ongoing currency debasement. And I'm gonna be on the show with Victor next, and we're gonna talk about this, I believe, in some detail, but that's where I think the value is, is that this is untethered from that existing system. Yeah. It is the escape, I suppose. Um, it's a network or mechanism for sending value digitally, right? It's a kind of money layer on the internet, as some have described. I think that's where the value is, that it's not controlled by any individual person, that if I wanted to give you $5 in Bitcoin, I can send you $5 in Bitcoin. Um, I can give you $5 in cash as well. But I think that's the value is in the value transmission mechanism that yeah. is you know, permissionless, right? I don't have to ask a bank if I can give you money. I can just send it digitally to you using the internet. Yeah, that's a great explanation. Um, I'd like to sum that down into one sentence. So, cause a lot of people had that same question. Like what's the value of this stuff? Number is gonna go up higher. We're gonna make more money in our go. worthless US dollars as we right. said. I want to tie this all back together really quickly before we wrap things up. The point of this show today was to just take a look at what others are saying in terms of their price targets. You know, we might be two guys on Tasty Live saying that we think Bitcoin can go to 100,000, but a lot of others that have looked at this 
believe that to be true as well. Doesn't mean that it's gonna happen, but it's a realistic outcome, which I think people should be prepared for, prepared for as an investor, so that you simply don't sell too early. I think in some of these cycles, that's the biggest mistake that you can make is to miss the majority of the move. And that's not just in crypto, but I think that's where there's some sort, you know, that's where the risk is. I don't know what that, if you heard that, what that was, but. Um, on your head, Ryan. Yeah, I think that's where sometimes, you know, the, the risk is um, in that, you know, you got back to break even after a down cycle, you're just on the wrong side of the trend, and then you miss that larger bull market move. These bull market moves, tend to be historically, you know, driven, these cycles driven by having events or having events precede larger, you know, upside in the market. So we've looked at that, have a little bit of a roadmap around it. I've covered this previously, but I just want to revisit it for a second. We've got the having upcoming estimated to occur in April. So next month, sooner than later, right? And if we look at prior havings, we don't have a ton of data around this. But we've seen the magnitude of those trough to peak returns reduced by about 70%, 74%, I think, on average, to be exact. So peak to trough during the last cycle, though the four-year period following the halving, we saw the price of Bitcoin return 594%, almost 600%, okay? So if we follow a similar pattern, and I'm not at all saying that we will. This is just a simple exercise in trying to determine what's realistically possible, right? I don't think this is out of the question. If we follow a similar pattern, we reduce that return by 74% or so, approximately 70%, we get a potential return in theory here of 178%. That's if you could time it perfectly from whatever the price of Bitcoin was on the day of the halving, and you sold the absolute peak if this is how it plays out, right? This is what we can assume. And if you use a current price, I know Bitcoin's above that, it's about 69 right now, but let's just say you use 65,000, then that gets you 180. I don't know, maybe it's 175, maybe it's higher, maybe it's a lot higher. But the point is, is that we're now in a new cycle, a new stage, there's new investors coming into the space. If you own this, this is how I would think about it. These having kind of market cycles in terms of when that peak typically occurs, at least previously, it's been about 500 days. So if I'm looking at the markets with no other roadmap other than what's happened in the past, I think this is realistic and these would be levels that I would be aiming for in terms of, okay, am I gonna sell? Maybe north of 150, I think we could get there. And if we're this long in the cycle, it's important to be aware of where we are, right? A lot of external factors could come into play here. But if we just go off of what's happened in the past, I think this is interesting. It's, I don't think it's insane. And when you look at what others think, we're definitely not on the, you know, the more insane side of price targets on the spectrum there. Yeah, when we're talking about investing in Bitcoin or you know, high market cap cryptos in general, I think the biggest risk is not investing at all. When I say investing, I mean a reasonable amount, amount that you're okay, maybe two, 3% of your portfolio because 40% of Americans own crypto, and that number is gonna be going up. And so you have to think in terms of spending um, and how much you, know, you have in the bank or in your wallet. And you don't want 80% of, the, of, of America to be able to have a lot much more money than you because that means the value you have is gonna go down even further. Yeah, I think you want some exposure to yeah. this asset, and you know, hopefully this is a you know, realistic kind of price target that we've, we've thrown out there. We'll see what happens. But that's going to do it for our show. Victor Jones is up next with The Price of Truth. I'll be back with Mike next Wednesday. I'll be back with Frank on Monday. Take a look at those liquidity pools we set up earlier this week. Check to see if we have any, um, I don't know, anything in our traps, I suppose. Yeah, we don't check our traps. It. Yeah. It's until, like those bees. <laughs> until then, I'm Ryan. I'm Mad Mike. Thanks for watching.